Welcome back, everybody, to the theme updates. If you could um, settle down. So, good morning. My name is Stefan Gruber, and um, this is a joyful occasion because on the first coffee break, it's already difficult to get people to come back and sit down because they're all speaking with each other. And seeing you all here and seeing you all engaged in old and in new groups and talking with each other makes me very, very happy because that's really why we have this network. We have some time now to hear from the theme leads from the network. And when we designed the network, we designed it to be a network. That means to make connections that didn't happen before. And this network, of course, also funds the research projects of a lot of students. And you see the outcomes, the results of many of these projects in the keynotes in the morning, in the posters. And then a lot of those projects get to work together in the working groups at the one university or at the other university supervised by one of the participating profs. And they, they work in the field very often with our partners. And then we have this other structure. We said we, we want to have themes that we have some sort of intermediate um, ability for people to get together and discuss about their research um, outside their immediate group. And what we'll hear now are the theme leads of those five themes. We have theme one is about characterization, in a way, what is going on at a particular location. Um, theme two is monitoring. How is permafrost changing over time? <clears throat> theme three is prediction. What can we say about the places where we haven't measured? What can we say about the times that we haven't measured in the future, for example? Theme four is hazards, the things that are caused by permafrost and permafrost thaw that are relevant to us. And theme five is adaptation. Well, what do we do to live best with these permafrost changes and hazards? And I want to thank the five theme leads who are going to come up now and, and speak about the, the research that goes on in their themes for what they've done over the past years in a network because they've hosted in a way that they found suitable meetings for groups of students, for partners um, to come together around those topics. And of course, those topics are not the only lens to look at how network research interacts and we'll have more conversations through the course of this annual general meeting that take different perspectives. But really the theme leads who are speaking to you now are the people who are closest to taking these ideas and thinking about and, and transforming it into synthesis products or transversal activities. So with that said, I'm happy to introduce Dwayne Fraze from the University of Alberta to you, who is the theme lead for theme one. And um, I'll leave the floor to you, Dwayne. Thanks. Thanks, Steph. Mm -hmm. Am I up? Okay. Um, okay, well, thanks. Um, this is really a great chance to see everybody from our network again, and lots of new people here who are probably perhaps a little bit new to the network. So as Stefan was saying, we're organized into themes. Um, I co-lead theme one with Daniel Fortier, who, who couldn't be here today. Um, and we're mostly interested in how do we characterize permafrost and especially ground ice. And, and we're interested in that mainly because the amount of ice in the ground determines the nature of thaw settlement and the sensitivity of the landscape. And so we're trying to come up with better methods both to work with databases and build um, models and data products and we're coming up with new tools to characterize permafrost and ground ice. And there's a few regional studies. And it's important to keep in mind that within the network, and it seems like it's really big, and it is quite big, um, the main way the network supports researchers like myself and the other um, principal investigators it has it mostly been to fund the students. So almost all of the money goes to the student grants that essentially pay the stipend. So in my case, I think 90 some percent of the money that we get just goes to student stipends. And so when we talk about some of the projects and things here, um, they're all funded by our own research programs separate from the network, but they're part of the network. So, the, and a lot of those are supported by our partners. For my case, since I work a lot in the SATU and in the Northwest Territories, 
um, either with the Northwest Territories government or through Satu Communities, SSI, those kinds of organizations that have helped support the field programs that we do and we work with them. So mostly what I'll talk about today is the student projects and each one of those has its own community connections and things that I'm not going to put a lot of attention to here because tomorrow we're going to be talking about some of those, some of those more specific things. So, okay. So theme one is about the characterization of permafrost. So this is a permafrost core, and the goal of theme one was really to develop new methods and new tools to make sure that we're doing this in a systematic way that is reproducible. We're also compiling a lot of data, and we're also undertaking um, additional field programs to fill in what we consider to be some of the gaps in knowledge that we have about permafrost properties in different regions. Some of those... Um, we're uh, making use of existing connections and projects and funding that we had through other sources and that in part sort of determined a little bit about where and what we, what we did. But mostly we were interested in aspects of ground ice. So there was uh, a few uh, different objectives of, the, um, of, the, of theme one and partly what we're trying to do is move to a place where data products like this one here, this map here called by David Olafelt, a colleague of mine at the University of Alberta put together. Um, there's a series of data products out there and compilations either at the scale of, of say a, a community area for ice or in the sense of a region or the sense of a national product like Canada for this that I think most of us would assume actually over predict the amount of ice in the ground and it as a result, it overpredicts, we think, a lot of the thaw sensitivity of different parts of the landscape. Some areas might have under predictions, but I think generally speaking, when we look at these products that, that take the entire Mackenzie Valley and say this area is super thaw sensitive, um, there's a lot more nuance to what's going on there. And most of those kinds of data products that have existed have been more or less um, rule-based things where people sort of take their best estimates of how they think the landscape works and they sort of draw big boundaries around that. So they're, they're generally not empirically driven. So they're not really based on a lot of observations. They're based on a few observations of experience. And permafrost researchers tend to go to ice-rich places in the landscape because those are the areas that a lot of dynamics are coming. But those aren't necessarily entirely representative of the landscape. And so a lot of our, our efforts are around trying to better understand some of those aspects in terms of permafrost and ground ice distribution. Um, so if we just look at the different projects, we had three postdoctoral research associate positions proposed, six PhD program, uh, students and two MSc students. And in the end, we ended up with um, three postdoctoral research associate people, including a new one, uh, Omid, who's going to talk tomorrow. Uh, four PhDs and uh, two MSCs that were both converted to PhDs, but there was a couple of positions that we never were able to fill in a timely way. So those those projects, some of them we were able to incorporate with other things, but generally speaking, that's kind of uh, where we end up with is sort of those sort of nine, um, I guess eight people right now, but nine that we had. And so this is the group that we had here. Uh, we've heard from Teddy and we've heard from Zakia. Now, Alexander was chairing the session this, this morning. I don't know if I can point with this at all. Yeah, I will. Um, and then we have a few people completed. Samuel Gagnon, uh, Maya, Rustai, Teddy, who have completed, and we have kind of uh, the rest of the group here. And so I'll, the investigators here, myself and Daniel Fortier, who are the co-leads, um, Jocelyn Haley from engineering at University of Calgary, Pascal, who's here, uh, Tony and Stefan. Um, Tony's not here, but Stefan is here. Um, and then partners, and mostly these are sort of the academic and government uh, partners that we have um, through some engineering firms like Chris Stevens and the Geological Survey of Canada, Peter and Brendan, Ashley Rudy, Steve Gokel at the Northwest Territories Survey, Sharon Smith, uh, Fabrice Kamels at uh, UConn University. And, and in fact, it's kind of evolved a bit over time with those partnerships that we have um, in terms of different groups as sort of the organic nature of collaborations and research have evolved. And so the progress, one of the big products that we have is what we call Pingo, which is a ground ice database. Uh, Michelle Paquette and Samuel Gagnon, who were both postdocs with Daniel Fortier early in the network, um, kind of got a draft of that database together and, and a little bit of the data together. The second big thing was the ground ice potential database that we'll hear about tomorrow. 
And this is really this big compilation. There's a lot of data about ground ice that exists um, in Canada in geotechnical data. In fact, there's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of measurements that have been made for industrial projects over the years. They're in variable states, and there's only a few variables that we really probably believe are probably well measured across those. And there's only maybe three or four measurements in those databases that are reliably present. And so one of the big efforts is to try to convert those data products into something that we can use as an empirical data product to say test how much ground ice is there since there's tens of thousands of boreholes. So just in the Mackenzie Valley between the Northwest Territories, Alberta border and Tuck more or less, there's more than 13,000 boreholes. That represents about 60,000 individual measurements of water content and by extension as we'll hear tomorrow when OMID talks about the ground ice potential database, converting that into ice abundance in the ground. So it's a big, big database. And we've made a lot of progress on that just in the last year and we'll talk about that tomorrow. And then the regional studies that have been taking place. Um, uh, Tabitha who's here, Alexander who was uh, speaking this morning, Joe Young who's not here, and one of the other positions, the polar desert position, high arctic position, which we were not able to ultimately fulfill. And then the next practices part, which is the non-destructive and digital archives. So some of the work that we've done in my lab with computed tomography and multi-sensor core logging to better have ways to um, estimate ground ice. And then field programs like Hossein's and uh, electrical resistivity that Teddy talked about this morning. Uh, I know Hossein has a poster here on the SIP. Um, Teddy spoke about her project this morning that has wrapped up. And uh, Zakia spoke this morning about the thaw settlement work. And I know Kateri is here and I think you have a poster on your work here as well. Yeah. So there's lots of chances to see that. Okay, so just a few of the highlights. Um, this is some of the equipment that we have in our lab where we've developed new ways to kind of work with frozen materials and essentially work with them non-destructively. So take, you know, drilling programs that maybe an engineering firm has sort of capture some of those cores and create sort of large uh, empirical data from those uh, in a systematic way that's reproducible. And so we've spent a lot of time on the calibration and the standardization of that. And that's involved my staff. At, we have a, a lab at the University of Alberta called the Permafrost Archives Lab. And so we've done a lot with the staff that we have there and with uh, Maya Ristai, who just finished with the network and is moving to a faculty position in Belgium in geotechnical engineering, has really helped to bring that along. Um, there's different tools that we use. And then also the CT side of this. And there's a few papers that have come from that. Some of them are listed in the handouts on the, on the student projects that we have there. But that work has moved along very well. And I think this is generally true that all of the student projects that we have have moved along very well. The ground ice potential database, which is using these large geotechnical data. So this is the work that Omid will pre present tomorrow that, that he essentially has picked up from Maya when she ended her position. And there were some additional resources from the network that allowed us to, um, to, to, to develop some of that. Um, uh, Hossein's project here on the spectral induced polarization, which is really getting at how do we map ice and water equivalents in the ground using uh, electrical methods. And so he did a lot of work this past uh, March, April in the Yukon with partners with Derek Cronmiller, who's here, and others um, from Yukon University. Uh, Kateri, who has her poster, has a new paper in review on some of the thermal modeling and trying to take some of these bigger ground ice products and turn them into things that might be of interest from a geotechnical perspective. And so this is a really good piece that's moving along. Mm -hmm. And it generally, I've said this before, but the student projects are all progressing very well. Zakia, who we already heard from this morning, she presented the details. This was a slide that she sent me on some of the, the materials here and one of the papers that her and Jocelyn just published this past year and moving from regional scale assessments to local scale assessments and, and also importantly standardizing the way that we look at these data sets and develop them. Uh, Joe Young, who's not here, was looking at a particular area in the Satu region that in the Mackenzie Mountain foothills, which is one of the biggest areas of landslides and landslides that have impacted streams. And this is an area that has been identified from communities of concern. And so he's looked at the controls on a, the distribution of these and what it says about ground ice. Um, and Alexander's project here, which is looking again at the lowland permafrost within the central Mackenzie Valley, more or less within the Satu region between Fort Good Hope and Toledo for the most part. 
and Tabitha, um, who is here, and she has a poster out here. I saw her at uh, this morning uh, talking about the Hudson Bay Lowlands, the area that she's working in, and the work that she's doing. And this is an important data set that we do not have very good representation right now in our big ground ice potential database. And this is one of the areas that we can really fill in some of that. And then Teddy, I think this is the last one here, Teddy's project that was on the ERT database that we heard from this morning. So I'm just going to jump ahead on that. And then the partnerships. There's a lot of partnerships with local communities and at the scale of the individual researchers who work with, the, with different groups or with different government groups in the various jurisdictions. Um, for my own group and others here, I think probably the, the, one of the biggest ones is with the Northwest Territories Geological Survey and Steve Coquel, who's uh, done a lot to facilitate that. And we've had involvement of our students with one of the big Thermocarst Collective mapping projects that was published this past year in Arctic Science with a bunch of people, Trevor's group, my group, and others within the network. And then with the Geological Survey of Canada group, which has really been trying to build their own national ground ice products and sort of working with them to kind of do version two of some of those products to put the vertical aspect of the ground ice within these ground ice maps and potentials. And the training and progress, generally speaking, I think we're progressing well. We had the challenge of trying to fill some of the positions at the start during COVID, and that was a real problem for, for quite a few of us, and some of the projects never did get filled because of those challenges. Um, the Ground Ice Potential Database is a big one because this is one of the synthesis products that goes across the network and across themes, and so we're going to talk, I'm not going to talk about that much today because Omid will present on that tomorrow. And then we'll talk about it again as we think about synthesis products and how we integrate these across the network between the themes. And I think that's the last one that I have there. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, thank you very much, Dwayne. Um, I think it's good if we move through the theme presentations in succession and then we see how much time we have in the end for questions. And if we don't, we will come back in various configurations to continue the conversation. So I'll welcome Trevor Lance, um, co-theme lead of theme two. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. I just want to start by saying, echoing the sentiments that others have shared about how fantastic it is to be here. I'm really looking forward to, you know, three days of opportunities to, to connect in person. You know, within the themes, we have the opportunity to, to chat on Zoom, but across the themes and, you know, for folks who are sort of on the edges or the periphery of the network, um, you know, this meeting is super valuable as an opportunity to, um, to connect and, and move some of these collaborations forward. Um, my name is Trevor Lance. I'm one of the, the co-leads for theme two. My uh, co-conspirator, Tony Lefkovich, um, is disappointed not to be able to be here this week, but had already committed to a PhD defense in Norway. So he's in Norway um, this week. Um, theme two focuses on monitoring and has the very modest objective of characterizing permafrost change and understanding permafrost change in Canada. Not a big deal. Um, uh, in simple terms, monitoring systems really consist of repeated measurements, recurrent measurements of particular phenomena with the intention of detecting trends. Uh, and so as you know, there are a number of well-established protocols that have been implemented at sites across, uh, across the world, things like measuring temperature you know, at the depth of zero annual amplitude in boreholes, making repeated measurements of active layer thickness uh, along site, along transects, or along um, uh, grids. So theme two, in terms of monitoring, seeks to build on these foundations, but really to kind of push in new directions, to develop new methods and, and new methodologies to kind of push the leading edge of, of what monitoring uh, of frozen ground is doing. So it includes a whole range of, of things that maybe are, you know, not are on the edges of, of permafrost science and what permafrost science has been traditionally. So uh, emerging methods in, in geophysics, new opportunities in remote sensing, connecting with indigenous knowledge holders um, to learn what we can glean from indigenous ways of knowing and, and land-based livelihoods about how permafrost systems are changing. So the projects that are in theme two are really kind of um, all across the board. There are two sub-theme objectives uh, that these, each of these projects fall into. And basically, to, you know, to characterize these in short form, the first sub-objective focuses on new methods for collecting new data, new ways of, of monitoring or watching Permafrost. The second sub-objective 
is more methodological and focuses on ways of analyzing both new and existing observations, so a little bit more on the, the synthesis side of things. I have two goals in my presentation today, the first of which is to kind of give you a tour of all of the active projects uh, occurring in Theme 2. All of the, the researchers whose work that I'll talk about briefly today are here at the AGM, so I'm going to be really brief uh, because these folks are much better positioned than I am to talk about the, the details of their work, the nuances of their work, and so I'll try to point to where they're giving talks or where their posters are so that you can connect with them in, in more detail. The second thing that I want to do at the end of my presentation is draw your attention to a uh, project in Theme 2 that's emerged in the last six months or so that you might be interested in chatting with us about or, or collaborating on, so I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. But I'd like to talk a little bit about Alison Pleurd's work. Um, Alison is a master's student uh, in the SAR lab, uh, super, supervised by Bernard, um, working uh, to develop methods to use INSAR data, but INSAR data collected during the winter to detect terrain deformation or displacement. Uh, and so to overcome the challenges provided by or presented by frost heave and snow conditions, Allison is combining spaceborne INSAR with ground-based measurements of snow water equivalent and terrain displacement, uh, and also working you know, to analyze the, the spatial variability, spatial pattern in those, those data sets. Allison has deployed a whole range of super cool instrumentation from uh, automated tilt meters that measure surface displacement at very high temporal and spatial resolutions, um, infrared snow depth sensors, as well as corner markers that allow her to disentangle the effects of uh, frost heave and snow on the, the uh, spaceborne INSAR signal. Um, we got a sneak peek about three weeks ago in a Theme 2 meeting of some of the data that's emerging, and it's super cool, um, you know, particularly the, you know, the, the fine scale heave meter and, and how that's connected to the other things that, that she's seeing. Allison is giving a talk on Wednesday mornings, so I won't say more than that, but other than to encourage you to check that out. Um, Emma Street, who we heard from you know, just before coffee, uh, is a PhD student in the Arctic Landscape Ecology Lab, working in partnership with Gwich'in and Anuvialuit land users, experts, and organizations in those, uh, those places. Has three objectives, the first of which is to document Inuvialuit and Gwich'in knowledge of, of permafrost using semi-structured interviews, also to use ethnographic mapping methods to understand um, observations, to document and understand observations that land users have made of permafrost change. And then the third objective, which she just spoke about, um, is, is to work with communities on community-driven, community-identified priorities related to permafrost. And so this is pretty open, um, but quite exciting. Um, it's a nice opportunity that Emma has just given a talk and I have the opportunity to publicly just say how fantastic a job that she's doing. Um, had a recent sort of milestone, completed the last interview, 110 interviews across eight communities in the Beaufort Delta region. This is an enormous amount of, of information um, that she's just started to kind of um, transcribe and, and, uh, and code and grapple with. And then next week, as she mentioned, we're really excited that she's gonna connect with the Gwich'in Renewable Resources Board and the New Alec Game Council to talk about the next steps for this project. You just heard Emma's talk. Emma also has a poster, uh, so please check that out. And is also speaking in the community needs session this afternoon, right? So two other opportunities to connect with Emma. Pete Castillo uh, is a new member of the Arctic Landscape Ecology Lab and member of Theme 2, who is working in collaboration with the Northwest Territories Thermocarst Collective to understand the determinants of the spatial distribution of polygonal terrain. So these areas of patterned ground that are rich in, in ground ice and ice wedges. Uh, so Pete is interested in uh, identifying the determinants of spatial pattern, the range of this feature, but also in predicting the sensitivity of this particular terrain type, the landscape sensitivity to uh, the development of ice wedge ponds that you can see in this, this photograph of uh, just uh, south of Tuktiuktuk. Pete's at a pretty early stage. He just started this fall, but is starting to parameterize a random forest model that will bring together data from the Thermocarst Collective with GIS data on a range of biogeophysical variables uh, to predict these, these things of interest. Uh, Pete has a poster, uh, or has a poster that is on its way, which will be posted soon. Um, so please connect with him uh, this afternoon at that poster to chat more about his work. Nick Brown, uh, as many of, many of you will know as the data scientist uh, in PermafrostNet, has recently agreed uh, to take on a special project. I have it as a special mission on this slide. Uh, to help with one of the projects in Theme 2 that was sort of temporarily paused 
when a student in the network was unable to continue with their work. This project focuses on using data from multiple depths within boreholes to develop new metrics of permafrost thermal change, but also uh, potentially subsidence. Uh, and so Nick is also thinking about how those new metrics will be visualized, the potential to visualize those metrics to think about um, communicating about permafrost change. Has made really excellent progress in pretty short order, uh, developing the code to calculate many of these new metrics, also to set up the simulation framework that will be used to assess and kind of figure out what these metrics actually tell us about how the ground is changing. Uh, has some very cool emerging data and also has a poster. Uh, so please connect with, with Nick uh, this afternoon to chat about that or, or drink coffee or lunch. A related project, a new master's student at Carleton in, in Stefan's lab, uh, Olivia Mary Legault, um, is working on building on these new metrics. So asking the question, what can these metrics tell us about what's happening at actual sites on the ground? So uh, using data from a range of boreholes across Canada to, to take these metrics and understand what they teach us about changes in the, the thermal condition of permafrost as well as, as ground subsidence. Also at a pretty early stage, just started this fall, um, starting to develop the, the workflow, uh, is particularly interested, I think, in talking with folks who have borehole data that could be integrated in this project. So if you have lots of borehole data, please visit Olivia at her poster um, and chat with her. Nick Spetchens uh, is a new postdoc in Theme 2 who arrived uh, at the, the University of Victoria in the Arctic Landscape Ecology Lab just this September. Uh, also working on a very modest project to develop a classification system for permafrost terrain types. Uh, this is a massive challenge. Um, and at the moment, Nick is doing a lot of reading and thinking about how people have thought about terrain types and permafrost, what, what scales have people worked at, what are the sort of important driving variables. It's also looking to other disciplines, to hydrology, to geology, to ecology, to think about how folks have, have grappled with this challenge of working across multiple spatial scales. And so all of this work will inform the development of a conceptual model, uh, which we hope will be implemented in a number of case studies. Um, and we're particularly interested in talking with folks who've, who've thought about this um, across the network and beyond, because it's a, it's a big issue, it's a big challenge to think about how to, how to move from you know, the specific site scale where maybe there's a borehole and a lot of uh, information about you know, the uh, terrain microtopography and organic layer thickness and a whole range of things that matter at fine scales, but, but to transcend that to also be able to work at national or, or global scales. I know that this is a topic that even just kind of raises blood pressure in the room, so um, please come and, and chat with us. Uh, and Nick, uh, has a, Nick has a presentation in the synthesis session tomorrow, so you'll have an opportunity to hear more about it then. Usman Iqbal is a, a PhD student uh, at Simon Fraser University in the SAR lab, uh, working, doing a number of things using um, airborne um, INSAR, airborne photogrammetry, spaceborne INSAR, and ground-based data collection to detect surface displacement at really fine scales. So at scales that matter for infrastructure managers has made a lot of progress, has almost totally completed the field collection component of this work, uh, and is working on the kind of data processing chains, is working in the southern Yukon in the Klawani region, uh, and also has some, some very cool data emerging. Usman has a poster, um, so please check that out um, over the next couple days and chat with him more. It's a pretty fast tour, but hopefully that gives you kind of a feel for the the diversity of, of projects that are happening in theme two. So not just different spatial scales, but different data types kind of all across, across the board in terms of the things that, um, that folks are working on. It's really exciting to see all of these new monitoring tools emerge uh, in a discipline where you know, monitoring, understanding permafrost change is really, really important. From a synthesis perspective, it's a little bit bewildering. One of the things that we said we'd do in theme two was to not only, you know, observe and understand permafrost change in Canada, but to synthesize all of the, the things that we've learned. And because the things that folks are measuring are so different and because people are at different stages, this is kind of a, a bit of a terrifying challenge. Um, and so in our initial discussions about what synthesis would look like, we were a little bit you know, stymied by how to move forward. And, and then we realized that actually just describing this kind of new toolkit, right, the new tools that are available for folks working in permafrost systems to understand what's happening at different scales in different places is probably a worthwhile contribution. You know, the number of folks that are um, 
mandated or interested in monitoring permafrost across Canada has increased a ton in the last couple decades. And so having a, a white paper or a short review paper that sort of provides an inventory of what's available, what the available options are, seemed like a, an actually a, an important synthesis starting point. So we've agreed to, as theme two, we've agreed to have a writing retreat to bring this, this uh, piece of work together. Uh, if you have an interest um, in contributing to that, you know, if you have a expertise in a specific monitoring modality and would like to participate in this exercise, please chat with me over the next couple of days. We don't have the specifics of the place and time yet, but we'll probably figure that out in the next month or so. So um, if you're keen, chat with me and we'll, we'll try to make sure that, that um, we can do it somewhere where you can join us. Uh, and I think we're, I have the next slide is questions, but I think we're moving on to um, team three. So thanks. Thank you, Trevor. It's really phenomenal to see all of this um, together in, 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 in such concise presentations. Um, I hope everybody's just as excited and happy as I am. Um, theme three is coming up. Joe Melton. Thank you, Joe. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I'll be uh, going over what uh, three and three has been up to. Um, uh, I'm a little bit rusty. I, I was on parental leave for the last while, so my theme knows more about what's going on than I do, um, which is a bit awkward, but that's okay. Uh, as I said, the, you'll see that they have talks and posters and stuff here that they can go over. Um, so how do we fit into the network? So our uh, theme is focused around prediction uh, or, or modeling, if you will. And you can see what our original objective was there, but how we fit in with the rest of the themes is we, we, we tend to take in information from themes one and two, we then use it in predictive models, and the idea is then that our information can flow out and help themes four and five. And um, the way that we do that is typically um, with process-based models, uh, because we're hoping to um, use the models to run forward into the future and give predictions that will stand up and then be reasonable in the future. And so statistical models tend to not be as well suited to this sort of task, because you tend to extrapolate um, beyond observed conditions. Whereas with a process-based model, the idea is, is that the model is based upon uh, the actual processes that you're trying to simulate themselves. So there's three models that you can see there. Uh, there's Classic, uh, Freestyle 1D, and then there's Geotop. And so Classic there has this kind of fancy schematic where you can see all the different processes that are represented within the model. Oh, actually, not all of them, but quite a bit of them that are in the model. And so uh, each of these processes is represented explicitly. And then as the model runs, that information from one process feeds into the next process, feeds into the next process. So um, you, know, the, you have a canopy, there's some interception of rainfall, then there's the amount that gets into the soil and how it moves in the soil. Um, in models like Classic, you even simulate uh, photosynthesis like occurring at the leaf level. And then from there, it scales up to the plant, and then the plants grow, that sort of thing. So the idea is using predictive models like this, we can hopefully um, come up with some relatively robust uh, results that we can um, use to like spatially fill in information because of course you can't go out and sample the landscape in every single location. You have to, you know, you have point locations and you need to know what goes on between your actual sampling points. And then of course temporally we want to know what happened maybe in the past when we didn't have our observing sites there or maybe in the future. Uh, how are these uh, locations going to change? So the, you know, who has been connected to the theme? Um, those in red are either um, uh, supervising students, they're on supervisory committees, or, or they've, they've really had pretty strong roles in projects. So there's been a fair number of people uh, involved with our theme. But of course, um, as I think Dwayne said, like, you know, a lot of the work is, is really actually just done by the students. Um, and so I'm going to go over a couple students who have finished just to go over what they've, uh, they've done. And then we'll go into the students that are here now. And so um, Maria, she completed her MSc with Claude. And uh, she was looking at old crow flats in the Yukon. And what she did was um, she used some SAR data, uh, data to um, create a data set where she had labeled uh, bedfast ice, uh, floating ice, land. And then because she had this time series of the SAR data, she trained a convolutional neural network using her labeled data set and then was able to say, OK, through time, how is the proportions of bedfast, floating ice, et cetera, changed? And from that, over this period, um, 1993 to 2021, uh, she was able to um, conclude that there was this, this, this large-scale transition um, 
from uh, two bed fast dice. And uh, they, they kind of correlated that with um, a growing number of these drainages uh, in the region from uh, climate warming and thermal karst processes. So there's a little image there of um, her labeled data set for just, for example, March 2021, seeing the proportion of those, uh, those three types on the landscape. And then uh, the next student uh, that's finished up was uh, Shao. And Shao was working with uh, Oliver and I. And uh, he did a, a really, really uh, fantastic job on his project. Um, for him, I can, I can say it because I know it really well. <laughs> Be, uh, but his work was global. And he took Classic, the community land surface scheme, including biogeochemical cycles. And within Classic, we have a soil uh, carbon scheme. And uh, with models like ours, there's often a lot of parameters. I mean, you have these equations, and the equations have certain numbers associated with them. Those are parameters. And often, the exact value that a parameter should be is not known. Um, you're not actually simulating, you know, the little microbes eating the carbon, that kind of thing. You're simulating these, these, these processes that kind of a, a zoomed out view. So you have parameters that represent things. So parameters are, again, just numbers. And one of the things that Shaw did that was really quite nice was he did a, a sensitivity analysis on the parameters. Because, you, again, you have all these linked equations. And the sensitivity analysis tells you, like, which of the parameters control the behavior of the model on the whole. And then from that sensitivity analysis, he picked out the, the most important parameters and he did a Bayesian optimization framework. So what you do is you take all these observations of, uh, in this case, um, core measurements of soil carbon or um, you have respiratory fluxes like heterotrophic respiration, so the carbon going up, and you run the model and within the Bayesian optimization framework, you compare it all of these different points and then you say, okay, um, the model is then this good. And then you, you, you try and keep improving that score that you're going against your observations. And when you're done, you kind of have this, this optimal parameters that gave you the best scoring against these observations that you're comparing your model's output to. And so Shaw did this, and we were able to then use his new parameter values within the model. And there's some really important differences that came out of this. So like an example is that um, the shared socioeconomic pathway 3.7, which is, you know, again, this is like, how the Earth's going to change in the future. And if you look at these Earth system modeling framework um, uh, future simulations, they go out and then they have these big, you know, up curves usually. So 3.70 is a moderate, a moderate one, kind of maybe similar to what we were doing. And his new parameters saw the model change um, exactly like how it was doing soil carbon. Um, it used to be uh, globally increasing because you have enhanced productivity from the vegetation biomass. You have carbon for dioxide fertilization. Within his new, using his new parameter values, actually the soil carbon globally gave off carbon. So that's an important difference that will make its way into the Earth system model of the Canadian Earth system model and then IPCC uh, assessments, that kind of thing. So now the students that are actually already underway, uh, we have Hannah, uh, Galena, and Rose. And they all are, uh, have posters here. I, I, I missed that for Galena, but she's got a poster here. Um, and both Hannah and Galena are going to be talking uh, tomorrow. I believe. Yeah. So please, um, you know, go to them for the information about their project. I think the you, they, they've, they've been making some quite nice progress. So I think there'll be a lot to share. And then Rose also has a poster. And uh, Rose's work um, is, is looking at how the influence of moss on the landscape, um, both from the, the physical perspective, but also from the biogeochemical. And her work kind of goes on um, top of some earlier work done by Dr. Gesa Meyer, who looked at putting shrubs into the model. Um, again, these models are process-based, and so like it sounds funny, but like they didn't obviously have shrubs at the start. Uh, and in fact, like very first models like this had kind of a green slime almost approach to things. And then you start doing trees and grass, and then you add shrubs, and you know, it goes like that. Um, either way, so uh, Hannah's work uh, is going to be looking at the quantifying like confidence in these simulations and seeing how well um, we can actually uh, trust the different model outputs. And uh, Galena is looking at um, how do you uh, create uh, ensembles of simulations for different reasons, or different regions, um, where you can kind of zero in and um, get some some simulation results in that region? So our our uh, our, sli our theme did have a couple of complications. Unfortunately, we had two PhD projects that um, did not complete and uh, weren't able to unfortunately get something out of. Um, the first one, um, it's been converted to a postdoc, but unfortunately there's no candidate at, president, at present to fill that position. And it does require um, kind of enough, enough specialized knowledge that it, it is challenging to fill that one. Uh, another one, uh, the other one, unfortunately, kind of ended up quite recently. 
Um, so it's, it's been quite challenging for us, um, you know, for our contributions to kind of um, network-wide um, products, um, it is, is uh, making it a bit challenging. Um, so the plans for the theme, though, um, I mean, as, it, as I've noticed here, we, we do have the three uh, students um, well underway, and we'll continue to try and support them to ensure their projects are uh, successful. Uh, and we've undergone some planning to try and backfill for those missing PhD projects. We have some ideas about how we can get around this. You know, it's, it's a speed bump for our theme, um, or here as like a massive pingo if you want it. <laughs> it's, it's very, uh, you know, it's challenging for us, um, but it is something that uh, we're going to, we have some ideas about what we can do. Um, time is unfortunately not exactly on our side, um, but there we are. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Joe. I will now always think of speed bumps when I see a pingo. Um, pretty big. Um, so our next theme will be theme four, Room for Hazards. And I'm welcoming Pascal roy Thank you, Pascal. Hello, everyone. So I'm here representing theme four, which is a theme focused on permafrost hazard. And our task is to help improve the, the knowledge of the knowledge, detection, and prediction of hazards in permafrost environment, permafrost related hazards. I'll, I've taken a bit of a, my, where should I point this at? So I've taken a bit of a know who's in your network approach, and I want to introduce you to the people of Theme 4. And Theme 4 has had some changes in leadership over time. When it was uh, first developed, when we planned the network and developed the ideas for the network, the leads for Theme 4 were Merit Turetsky, which you can see here, and as well as Scott Lamoureux. You can see them on the left on the slide there. And so Merit and Scott are people who... Uh, at the start of the network brought together how are we going to tackle permafrost hazards in permafrost net and they started bringing the idea in that we should broaden our perspective on permafrost hazard and not just think of hazards uh, to infrastructure for example that in the more classical way that we've been looking at but also introducing ideas such as uh, consequences um, well the ecosystem impacts on on the ecosystem services that are provided by permafrost environment so impacts on water quality and impacts on carbon storage perhaps as well so they brought these ideas in unfortunately or fortunately for them I don't know but that's the way life goes so Merit uh, left us to go work at uh, the university um, in Boulder Colorado she was the president of INSAR the Institute uh, the Arctic Research Institute of North America. She was the first woman in that position, but her moving to the United States meant that she left the network as a PI, and then Scott retired, is happily retired now, and so as a result of that, two new co-leads came in for Theme 4, and that was Jocelyn and I. So Jocelyn uh, is at University of Calgary. She was the head of the civil engineering department, bringing an engineering perspective to theme four. She's not here, unfortunately, for this meeting because she's on admin leave, being a good role model for us all for work-life balance. <laughs> and I'm the one who's here representing theme four today. So for those of you who don't know me or who don't know where I'm at these days, I'm uh, now an associate professor of geography at Université Laval. I'm a research chair in permafrost geomorphology in uh, Nunavik, and uh, my team has projects across the country, and we at Université Laval do applied and fundamental permafrost geomorphology research, but we really pride ourselves in working at the scale of communities, working at the scale of traditional territories, working at the scale of people's lived direct experience of permafrost change and permafrost hazards. And I think that I really like uh, being part of Team 4 and working with the Team 4 group, because a lot of people in Team 4 share that same idea of wanting to work at a scale that's commensurate with how people live from a frost change in the north. So, of course, there's not just uh, having a hard time for, for uh, the co-leads in the theme. There's a lot of people involved in the team, including some PIs. You're seeing a picture of everyone here. I'll go over the different projects quickly, but I wanted to point out Peter Morse, who's in the top left corner, and uh, Brian Mormon in particular, who have been really there for every one of the meetings at Team 4, and so are, are sort of uh, uh, 
part of the leadership of Team 4, always there providing advice and, and have been there all along. But there's also Northern partners here from across the country and different students who are contributing to our mission of improving knowledge of permafrost hazards. Team 4 is meant to be using the information that's produced by Team 1, 2, and 3, which you've just heard of, and then producing information and improved knowledge of hazards that can be useful to the people of Team 4, which you're about to hear from in a little bit. That's always difficult to do in a network, of course, because all of the projects are evolving at the same time. But the way we tackle that challenge is by having some students who have one leg in our team and a leg in another theme as well, and also having projects that are supervised by PIs that are involved in the other theme, and that helps us build projects that impact both themes, bring information together, and, and it helps us share information between the themes. So these people are are critical to ensuring we fulfill our role in the network. So we are looking at a range of hazards in Team 4. The projects that we have uh, cover different things, including uh, mass movements, flooding and changes in water quality that are linked to permafrost change, contaminant mobilization, particularly mercury, and that aspect is very much linked to changes in people's traditional territory, changes in vegetation, and changes in terrain. So these two components you'll see are, are linked together in the project. So let me tell you about some of the projects that are going on, and I'll start with slope stability. We have quite a few projects that have to do with slope stability. So I have to take my glasses off to see the Confident screen, probably. Okay, so we have some slope stability project in coastal settings, in inland setting, and also in alpine settings, which you'll see on the next slide. So working on slope stability in coastal settings, we have Andrew Clark, who is going to be here, and I think he'll be giving a talk tomorrow morning at the beginning of the day. And he has a poster, which is not quite up yet. He's supervised by Brian, so I'm looking at you to confirm, right? Yeah, he hasn't arrived yet. Oh yeah, you are here. <laughs> Everyone, there's Andrew. Okay, so you can <laughs> visit Andrew at his poster kit to get more information. You'll hear more about his project uh, tomorrow morning. So Andrew's moved along quite nicely. You can see in the corner, there, there's two papers that have already been produced. There's a published, there's a third paper on the way he's been using um, unmanned aircraft drones, drone imagery to improve prediction of, of uh, mass movements and where they're likely to occur in a coastal mm -hmm. setting. And then inland, we have Caitlin Dietrich, who is working with Trevor Lance. So here you can see a photo of Caitlin. She's working with Peter, and she's working with Trevor. Went to the field this summer for the first time, but I think the forest fires kind of threw a bit of a wrench in, in the plans. I'm looking for Caitlin. Do you want to wave? I know you're here. There you go. Caitlin is over there. She has a poster also, so you can visit her. My slides are changing by themselves. That must mean I'm being too slow. And so I, on the previous slide, though, can I go back? On the previous slide, though, there is also Liam Carson, which you can see there beside the photo of Brian, who's a new student who's starting uh, in Brian's lab as well, and who'll be working on slope stability in glaciated, setting glaciated environments. Probably he's just starting and, and developing his project. So that's a new person on the team who's not here with us yet, uh, unfortunately. Today. Okay, oops. Okay, so in more alpine settings, we have some people who are part of Stefan Gruber's team, and we have Emily Stewart-Jones, actually, who finished her work and has now graduated and was looking at permafrost and heterogeneous steep bedrock slopes. The two projects that you see here originally were part of one PhD, but they were separated into, masters, into two masters projects. So Emily has now graduated, and Emily lives in Whitehorse in the Yukon and now works for Water Resources. That's something that we're very proud of. Of course, when we train people who continue to work in the North through research or who live in the North, and then contribute to building capacity in the north for dealing with uh, permafrost hazards of all sorts. So Emily is one of those who was from the north and is now uh, working for the Yukon government. And then there's a second student, Pia Blake, who is also from the north doing a master's. And Pia is a little bit further down on the slopes, so looking at uh, slopes that are moderate slopes and that are also uh, vegetated. And I think Pia has a poster. Pia, do you want to wait? Hello, Pia is here. She has a poster, so you can go and visit her to learn more about her great project. Okay, so in the Theme 4 group, we also have 
some work done on water quality and contaminants. As I said, that's linked to changes in people's traditional uh, territories and in changes on the land. So we have Erica Hill, who's not here, unfortunately, for this meeting, but Erica is working with Melissa Lafreniere, who is here over there, and Erica has a poster uh, that you can go and see to learn more about her work. Erica published a paper in, in uh, Nature Geoscience and Environmental Reviews about using geo, uh, hydrogeochemistry for the monitoring of Arctic watershed, and is still working on her PhD, looking at uh, the impacts of permafrost change on different rivers in the Northwest Territories. And then also touching on water quality and the mobilization of contaminants, or more on the mobilization of contaminants side, we have two other people. There's Adam Kirkwood, who's working in the Hudson Bay lowlands of northern Ontario and northern Manitoba. And he's interested in permafrost degradation and the mobilization of mercury. So the work that Adam is doing there is following from some of the large-scale models that have been put out on mercury and permafrost and potential consequences of thaw, which showed the Hudson Bay lowlands in black. There was so much mercury in it and was really stressful for local communities because that's there who rely on traditional food sources. So Adam has gone there. He has some community partners in, in northern Ontario in particular, has collected data, sort of look with local regional field data and, and redo those estimates and found that the mercury storage is actually 10 times lower than what was originally predicted when you calibrate the model with field data. And so we also have, just let me go back for a second. And we also have Nicole Corbière. Nicole is here actually, she's waving over there, who's looking at the impacts of catastrophic lake drainages in Old Crow Flats, which have been happening at an increased rate on the methylation of, the, of mercury. So mercury that is in the environment cannot bioaccumulate unless it gets methylated by microbial activity. That's the ecotoxic form is methylmercury. So certain environments favor the formation of that mercury. And, and Nicole has been looking at impacts of an increasing number of drain basins in the landscape on the mercury cycle, and particularly methylation. So here you can see some of Nicole's work again, along with some work by, uh, I put Adam's photo there again, because Adam's work on the Hudson Bay Lowland is also touching on how permafrost degradation and the evolution of this landscape will affect mercury uh, methylation. Same thing with Nicole, there's a component of seeing how the drain basins, this landscape is changing, how is that affecting the methylation of mercury. The first picture that you're seeing on the left is Danielle Chiasson. Danielle, can you wave? Collecting a peat core in Old Crow Flats also, who's working in old drain basins and trying to see if what we're seeing now in drain basins in terms of vegetation succession and permafrost aggradation resembled what used to happen prior to climate warming in previous conditions to, to help understand what's a long-term change or, or what isn't, especially with the arrival of shrubs, for example. Uh, next, you see in the middle there, a photo of Tabata Ramen, who's also working in theme one and in theme three. Tabata is working in the Hudson's Bay lowland in northern Manitoba along the Hudson's Bay Railway. So some of her work contributes to theme one with mapping ground ice and some of her PhD work also contributes to understanding how that ground ice will affect the evolution of that landscape in a warming climate. Tabata, can you wave? Tabata has a poster as well. And then you can see Nicole here again. I wanted to show, Nicole is somebody who has multiple talents and so you see her there cutting permafrost cores, and she came from a technical chemical engineering uh, degree background. But Nicole is also an artist and an Anishinaabe Kwe from Wekwemekong First Nation, and part of her work has been combining all the different skills and knowledge that she has, including some of the art that she can do uh, that's inspired by her own culture, to find better ways of communicating about hazards with the community. So I invite you to see her poster, which is beautiful, but also talking about, uh, about that with her. She has a lot to share on the topic. And finally, we have this last position here, which is just, just starting, and it's Jackie Ziegler. Jackie, can you wait? You'll hear more about Jackie as well, because that is one of our synthesis products for theme four. She's working on one, Jackie isn't the synthesis product, but she's working on one of the synthesis sorry, products for theme four. She just started this Wednesday, so she's brand new, fresh into this project. And we're really excited, actually, because it's a position that has to do with talking about stakeholders, talking about researchers, about pe with people who live in the North to better 
better understand thought-driven hazards and whether improve the way that we communicate and share knowledge between us on thought-driven hazards. And so she will be um, communicating with different stakeholders. So on the right-hand side there, I put some of the Northern people who will surely be contacted, but she's starting to make a list which is getting very long of the people she should talk to. And then we will be back tomorrow to get some of your input to make sure that the right places, the hazards are, are the right hazards are included, I guess, the right people are on the list to be contacted and, and so on. So we'll be back with more on that topic. So that's my overview of Team 4. Thank you very much for... Okay. Thank you very much, Pascal, for this overview of Theme 4. And I'd like to invite Riley Beddo now to speak about Theme 5, or Chris Byrne. <laughs> Riley Beddo. <laughs> Welcome, Riley and Chris. <laughs> OK. Well, hello, everyone. Um, last but not least, we are up here representing Theme 5. Uh, my name is Riley Beto. I'm an associate prof at the Royal Military College. And uh, I work in the Carleton University. And your name is? My name is Chris Byrne. <laughs> And we are really excited to share with you um, some of the things that we've been working on in Theme 5. And so without further ado... Pass it over to Chris. So we've been doing projects that are associated with how people are actually dealing with climate change impacts on permafrost. Some of these are design projects. Some of these are financial projects. Uh, and some of these are uh, projects that are associated with, with potential where we are looking for what may happen and find a place where it is happening. And so rather than spend much time talking about the people involved, we decided to jump right to the projects um, and sort of showcase some of the work that's been done by the students in our theme. But lucky for us, we actually don't have that many students still working on our theme because you're going to see we've got lots who have completed. But to speak to what Pascal said, we're fortunate to have a number of students who have spent a little bit of time in theme five, uh, sort of having that one foot in our theme is along with others. So one of the students you've already heard of who is still currently working um, on his, his PhD is Adam. We won't spend much time talking about it, Pascal already did, but here's an example of some of the work um, that's going on in theme five. And the second student who's still actively working in theme five work is Ray. And you will listen to Ray on Wednesday morning when she gives you some uh, indication about how Things that we didn't hope would happen have actually happened. So, Ray, do you want to just wave and say hi? Okay, so Ray's over there. So we're really looking forward to that. But what we want to do is highlight some of the amazing work that has been done. And so without further ado, we'll kick it over to Pat. So Pat Jardine, uh, one of the people who graduated this year, he graduated in September. And not only did he graduate, but he also completed a paper which should come back within the next week, perhaps because it's one of the ICOP papers. Oh. And, <laughs> and as we all know, Riley is in charge. <laughs> uh, he, Pat completed an experimental investigation in central Yukon, both on the Dempster Highway and in one of the little mining roads near to Mayo on the impact or the effect of uh, snow crushing on the re redu reduction of near surface ground temperatures in the winter time. The idea was that perhaps this is one way to mitigate the impact both of climate change or of the obstructions that uh, embankments produce and therefore the accumulation of snow next to the uh, embankment. It is possible to uh, produce a, a system using thermosiphons, which costs something like $8 million per kilometer, or you could pay somebody perhaps $2,000 or $3,000 a winter to look after the same problem. And the $8 million a kilometer is one which has been tried and tested by the government of Yukon, and the companies are very happy with that. But this, this approach is one which uh, may be used on a much more effective basis by people who live in the region where the problems occur. 
And one of the things that we really prided ourselves on in Theme 5 was bringing in students who weren't necessarily part of the network specifically and traditionally, but who were participating because they were working on projects that were similar. So for example, there was a student who was working on snow compaction, but using thermal modeling. And so they were able to have those conversations of what's it like to be out in the field and actually take these measurements, and what is it like to actually take a snowmobile, and what does that do to the snow, to explain that to somebody, especially during COVID times, who was sitting in his basement, unfortunately, doing numerical modeling. And so that was one of the things that we tried to do with Theme 5. We were very lucky in Theme 5 that the First Nation of Nacho Nectan welcomed Pat, even during COVID, because they were all outside all the time at 30 below. The next, uh, the next person who's completed is Astrid uh, Schetzler. And Astrid uh, is now working for uh, Highways in uh, Whitehorse. Astrid's project was associated with determining how much climate change has cost the uh, maintenance activities of the government of Yukon. So she uh, had access to a database from 1994 through to 2022, and she was able to trace through that time how costs have gone up and uh, was, has produced, again, uh, one of the little articles which Riley is in charge of and which we will all be able to read fairly soon. Very soon. <laughs> very, very soon. Oh, so this is Payam. Payam was a master student um, with me at the at RMC, and he was trying to look and understand sort of the impact of some of the hazards that had occurred along the Hudson's Bay Railroad, um, and some of the remediation and adaptation measures they took. And one of those things was using geocells. So you can imagine you've got this honeycomb structure. You put it underneath the ballast in the bed of a uh, railway, and you're actually able to then support it when you have these deformations that are occurring. And so he was looking at trying to understand sort of the impact of that under different um, climate scenarios and trying to feed that back into the Hudson's Bay Railway to give them some validation on using such an expensive approach, but one that is, that is working. And then so sort of a highlight of some of the students and some of the work they were doing. But as I said, we really prided ourselves on trying to encourage more students to be part of our permafrost net student community. And so one of the things we did in March is we actually held sort of a theme five meeting um, where everybody sort of in the Kingston region went up to Ottawa and it was a large group, whether it was three, five, four, three, two, I think we had somebody from almost every theme that was there. Uh, and that didn't stop there. So recently we have meetings that are done on Zoom and we actually had students, and I'm sorry if I spelled people's names incorrectly, this was, you know, as one does late at night, just before today. But we really appreciate, we had people from theme three come and give a presentation on some of the work they're doing. So really trying to encourage that collaboration between the network. So thank you to Hannah, Gabriel, and Pia for those amazing presentations. One of the things that really helped us was actually COVID. And that was that at the very beginning of the network, when everybody thought, oh, it's a disaster, uh, be many people wanted to gather together and the theme five meetings, which started in the September of the first year of uh, COVID, in other words, September 2020, um, were, were attended by something like 15 students, not just from theme five, but from other themes and from other people who were relate on, on related projects. It, it, this would not have happened if we hadn't had COVID because I'm sure if we hadn't had COVID, we wouldn't have had so much Zoom possibility that had happened. So it is actually a long-standing development. It is true that by about nine months or maybe one year, people are getting a little bit you know, less enthusiastic about Zoom meetings. But at the beginning, it was a really good way to get people together and to get people to know each other and be aware of each other, even though we weren't specifically in the same place. And so to speak to some of those broader Theme 5 student communities, these are students who were part of, part of Theme 5, and didn't have any idea that Theme 5 was anything different other than they were invited to these meetings. So some of the work that was done by students like Trevor. So Trevor Anderson is another student in the geography department and he was working on the very, very high winds that cross the Dempster Highway. They knock uh, vehicles into the ditch or down the hill. And these things uh, lead to closure of the Dempster Highway in the winter for upwards of 30% of the winter time. So something between 30 and 40% of the winter, the road may actually be closed because of these very strong winds at a small location. So his research uh, was directly associated with other people in the engineering component of Theme 5 who were interested in things like highway operation. 
So rather than just being interested in what's underneath the embankment, uh, his work was associated with what's going on on top of the embankment. Natalie Arpin was an active member in Theme 5 and still is, and she's looking at frost jacking of piles that are used for bridges, well, used for bridges everywhere, but along the Hudson's Bay Railway, they're really um, experiencing a lot of jacking. So she's looking at doing monitoring, doing in situ monitoring, and also doing laboratory experiments um, to try and quantify and better understand uh, to then therefore be able to better design these for the future. John Gallagher recently completed. He was part of our sort of broader Theme 5 network, also looking at the Hudson's Bay Railway and looking at it as a linear infrastructure monitoring tool itself. So really taking some of the track classifications that they use for how fast the train can go and trying to understand sort of how those deformations change over time with the data that they're collecting already. And we'd like to maybe invite Sean, who I see here. Do you want to speak really quickly, Sean, just about what Frederic's doing? And we'll pass you a mic so I think people on Zoom can hear. Yeah, so Frederick is involved with uh, another NSERC project, uh, Create Utility, so primarily looking at the use of drones, and he's looking at uh, three levels or scales, uh, both at the local community level of uh, Nacho Nyakdan, um, and looking along the Stewart River and then uh, generally or broadly at larger landscapes in the watershed level. Uh, primarily looking at um, long-term monitoring, both using uh, drones and also he did some ERT surveys this past summer and, um, and also looking at uh, use of collective archival data and also uh, camera monitoring at the sites as well. And Sean, do you want to just introduce yourself too? <laughs> yeah, I might as well, I guess. Uh, Sean Kenny, Carleton University, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Wonderful. Thanks, Sean. And we could go on, right? So this is a student who was looking at sort of the impact of using those expensive thermosiphons and what that might do for the longevity of something like a buried arch culvert um, along the ITH. So... One of the things we wanted to do and what we realized has happened is that there's a number of students. So here's sort of some of those theme five wide, not necessarily directly being funded um, by, by theme five and, and permafrostnet. But the list goes on. And there's a lot of people in this room who have spent time with us in theme five. Some of them have stayed. Some of them have told us that they have too many feet in too many themes and, and might not be able to join us all the time. But there is a lot of amazing people in this room who, ha who have brought their research and the knowledge that you're using and doing into Theme 5 to help us with this idea of adaptation. And if you aren't on this list and are interested, we're always looking for more people to join our meeting. So please don't hesitate to come and talk to Chris, myself, or any of the students you see on this list, because the more we learn from each other, the better it will all be, the more we get together. Right? Yeah. So to sort of wrap back up with the principle and objective of Theme 5 is really about supporting Northerners in an ad adaptation to permafrost in transition. And so when we think about that sentence, and where we've come five years later, what we realize is we've really worked to develop people who are going to support adaptation into the future. So when we look at that list of people and where they're going, some are staying within a permafrost realm, some aren't, but all are working towards um, supporting adaptation and permafrost. I'll pass it over to Chris for final words. The, the final word I have is a thank you to uh, Stefan. Uh, and I'd like to thank Stefan for all the work that he did at the beginning to get this whole thing running. But I also want to thank him particularly because I would never have worked with Riley <laughs> if, if Stefan had not got this whole thing running. And for me, of all of the things in PermafrostNet, the ability to work with somebody who's interested in the same things, but looking at them through slightly different glasses is really been a tremendous learning experience. And so thank you for being there. Oh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Riley and Chris, and I hope we all, all share the, the joy of seeing things through different perspectives. Um, one might think that the theme leads don't really care about their themes because everything's finished on time. I mean, very often as academics, when we speak about something we love, 
you know, we tend to go on. So thank you everybody for being like so concise and giving such wonderful summaries. And I think this is probably one of the densest summaries that we have of what's going on in the network. And um, we have about 15 minutes left for discussion. And what I propose is that we'll just take questions and comments that might be addressed to any of the theme leads present um, or to anybody else. And we have mobile um, microphones going around. And that will probably be a good time to spend the remaining 15, 20 minutes before lunch. So who would like to start with the first question or comment? Robert, right? Thank you, uh, Robert. Charlie, I'm the chair of the Clean Renewable Resource Board. I have a, a number of questions, I guess, but number one, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, leaders spoke about uh, community involvement, but they didn't really expand on it. And I didn't see very many pictures of Aboriginal people on the slides participating in the project. So my question is, uh, are community members involved in the project? In what capacity, and have you left a legacy of people in, in the communities that can now participate in future projects? Uh, the other question related to the use of uh, uh, databases from past, uh, I think it's the Mackenzie Gas Project and also the Arctic uh, Gas Project, and I'm just wondering if, if you have current data from today that you can compare to the past uh, past data that was collected because we know that there's been a lot of changes since that project was initiated way back when and was eventually stopped. But yeah, those are a couple of my questions. And uh, yeah, because I, I know there are a lot of, uh, there is funding from Canada to hire summer students. And just wondering if, the team leads can maybe respond to my questions. Thank you, Robert. So maybe I'll, I'll um, take a, an introductory stab at question one, and then we'll see who can respond about the involvement of Northerners in specific projects. And maybe after that, for your second question about the, the databases, Duane, after that, if you might answer. Just as a quick response, because you've seen how diverse this, this network is. So there are some people who simulate things, there are people who analyze data, and there's people who go into the field. So the level and type of involvement of northerners or community members is, of course, varying with that. So in some projects, there will be no involvement. And in other projects, there will be very, very deep involvement. Um, is there someone who could give an example of involvement in their projects? Just as a, as a response. Chris, you have a microphone. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much, Robert, for the question. That was really appreciated. So I, ca I can't speak in, in kind of like th a summary for everybody, but what I can give is an example. And I'll give the example of the project that Pat Jardine did. So his project was going to be organized through the highways department of Yukon Territorial Government, but it turned out that they, they couldn't organize it. For I don't, I don't, I can't, I have... A, an understanding of why they couldn't, but it's not the sort of thing I would want to broadcast in public. Uh, so NND, that is the First Nation of Nacho Nyectan, stepped in and they said, well, if you need people to drive Skidoo, I think we can probably provide people to drive Skidoo. And so Pat and Jennifer Humphreys, who's here, uh, was and, and had just finished her master's degree at the time, they uh, were able to go to Mayo and arrange with the land guardians, who are uh, particularly Gary Hope and Blaine Peter, to travel up to two sites, one on the southern uh, Dempster Highway and the other on the South McQuiston Road, and on a monthly basis to compact the snow using snow machines. Now, it was been impossible to conduct this experiment or this activity, this research, without their participation. It would have been, the whole project would have collapsed completely if uh, Adrian Hill and the other people at NND had not produced uh, the, resource, the resources to do this. And subsequently, um, I didn't 
uh, maybe this was a mistake, but I don't think it was a mistake. I didn't get um, the people from NND involved in the supervision of Pat Jardine's thesis. That process took two and a half years, so some people will know that sometimes it takes a long time. So that didn't happen. But when we wrote the article that goes to the International Poem Frost Conference next year, Gary and Blaine are part of the, the author team for that. So in that sense, there was, that was the sort of connection that those community members had. And it does lead a, somewhat of a legacy because they know what they did and it's part of the land's branches activities at NND. So that's an example. A completely different example is, and, and is um, uh, Trevor Anderson's project uh, on the high winds just on Hurricane Alley, actually on both sides of the, of the border. And in that case, the activity, because there's no community actually located there, um, the activity was with uh, the highways department. So uh, Kathy Braze, who I'm sure you know, uh, was was really sort of instrumental. And the other people from McPherson who come and, and work on the highway out of the Yukon Highway Garage they at Eagle Plains, they were involved in, in some of the monitoring. Uh, and I would also say that one of the immediate prop, immediate activities that that led to was the ability to, we put, I'm sure you've seen the little weather stations that are alongside the road in that, in that area. Those actually go directly to a, um, a, a database called the Campbell Cloud. And Kathy and people who are operating the road now actually know what the wind speed is there. And as the wind speed gets up to 80 kilometers an hour, crosswind, they then say, we're going to close the road. Whereas before, they had to wait for somebody to come in and abuse them as to why the road wasn't closed. <laughs> so now it can be done in real time. Um, and that, that would be, that's, they're really people who are there operating that infrastructure. So that's another connection. And again, when that material is, is published, then Kathy Braze is part of the publication team for that. So those would just be two examples, but it's, in other projects, it's completely different. Thank you, Chris, and maybe we can have Oliver and also Trevor after that to briefly speak. I would like to provide an example for Team Trade and related to Team Trade, where there's a community, community corporation. We have, oops, so we were close with the Innovi Community Corporation as part of Team 3, and we have one of the yeah, members involved here, that's Trent, and there was also Trevor Kaklik, I don't know if you know him, from, from Innovic, and Camelia Gray, and they helped us with the operation of our infrastructure at Trail Valley Creek Research Camp, it's along the ITH, and you see maybe the, maybe you've seen the tents, the orange tents in the distance, and uh, those community members have been really helpful operating our equipment year round, especially checking on things in the winter when we weren't able to spend time in the field, and that's been absolutely instrumental to keep instrumentation up and running year round. And Trevor uh, Trent came to Toronto last year to present the work himself at the uh, ArcticNet conference. So, just as another example, I think you were there too. If I remember correctly. Thank you. Uh, Trevor? I think there's lots of, um, I mean, I think we could go on with, with more examples. I guess I want <clears throat> to speak to a little bit of a higher level and acknowledge that. Um, you know, within the context of this network, I think we've we've moved the needle a little bit. <clears throat> you know, at the outset of the project, we realized that the network was, was committed to doing more around Indigenous engagement and um, community partnerships. But there's, you know, right off the hop, there were some structural barriers that we encountered. You know, funding from NSERC, you have to follow certain rules. And so to, in order to do that, we had to sort of get creative about, you know, creating additional funds asking universities to contribute money that we could use to uh, to engage and hire local field assistants and, and to bring people into to the network. Um, but, you know, I guess the point that I want to make is that we've we've moved the needle a little bit, but and there's lots of great examples, but we need to do we need to do a lot more. Right. And so in the context of the network, one of the things that that we did uh, within the first year was develop an enge indigenous engagement sort of set of principles and action items. Um, and that was approved by the, the board of directors maybe after or two years or so, and, and so that's out there and has kind of guided uh, activities within the network uh, around how to kind of 
continue to push the envelope a bit because there's lots of cool stuff, but there needs to be more, right? Um, it's, it's not enough and we need to kind of keep pushing on that, that front. And, um, and there's, a, I think, a great guideline that, you know, extends beyond permafrost net within the geosciences for, for how to do that, you know, in that uh, set of principles. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. And I think um, if, if, if it's okay, well, we have one more on this topic, then we'll move to Duane. Um, it's wonderful, even the breadth of responses that we get now to your question. Hi, I'm, I'm Lina. I'm from Université de Montréal. I'll stand up so that I can see you. Um, can you, I'm going to repeat just to make sure that I understood your question well. Was your question about how uh, the scientists are committing to work better with communities and how they're doing it? Was that, was that your question? Not only scientists, but any, anybody that's involved with research in, in the community. And, and you wanted to understand, like, what are the concrete steps that they're taking to involve people from the community? Uh, yes, I, I wanted to see, you know, if you've engaged with the community prior to your research taking place, and then also the involvement of community members in the research that you're doing in, in the region. Um, I'm not necessarily going to speak to that because I'm not a scientist, but I want to bounce back a question towards you, if, if I may, about the... Um, I, I'm working on a podcast right now where I went to the North uh, two years ago and I, I talked to a bunch of people from different communities um, to like more un understand more like the needs and like what certain people are looking for, or how they're involved with the research and what their views on research is just as a, as a general thing. And often something that came up was about the resources that existed in communities to be able to like be involved in certain research projects. Um, and I wanna throw the question towards you that is, so how, what do you, how do you think scientists should like um, engage with people from different communities knowing that various communities have various capacities in terms of like resources or like people to be able to like um, deal with um, uh, like various projects coming in and like doing you know all that all that triage work. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm I'm from the uh, community of Inuvik. I'm or originally from Fort McPherson. We have a land claim agreement, and within that land claim agreement, it gives us the, us the ability to to determine what activities will take place within the Gwich'in Settlement area. And uh, we, uh, as a board, uh, develop a research priority exercise, working with the uh, Renewable Resource Councils and the community members. So they, they, they drive the process. And then we, we may reach out uh, to, to advertise for potential researchers that want to do research in our area. And then the board would determine what, based on what what the priorities are, what research we, we want to take place in, in the in the region, and then uh, we, we develop that partnership. But uh, we hope that the uh, researchers coming in would meet with the communities, uh, talk to them about what research is going to take place, uh, how they plan to carry out the research how they're going to involve the community members. Uh, we're limited on the resources that we get, so we're dependent on the researchers to compensate our members uh, to assist with the research. So yeah, things have changed from years ago when researchers came in, did the research, and then you never saw them again. But at the end of the day, you would see the, the PhD at the end of their name we're taking, you know, doing the research in our area. So things have changed now where uh, we're in control. We, we can uh, work as researchers and, and uh, work on the priorities that are important to our people. And, you know, we, uh, our people are still subsistence uh, hunters and fishers. So we're very dependent on the land. So as a result, a lot of the research that we want in the region would be associated with those uh, species that are important to us and 
uh, you know, with permafrost melt, uh, there's lots of impacts on on the land base. So, you know, anything related to that would be really important to us. And permafrost is melt melt is one of the uh, one of the priorities as well as any climate impact because we're, we're seeing a lot of changes in the region. So, yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah, and I think we will probably continue this um, this discussion a lot during those three days. Before we break for lunch, Duane, if you can briefly speak to the issue of the boreholes. Sure. Sure, but I'll just mention one of the projects we have. So most of my work's in the Satu region. And so we have a, uh, a series of projects with the Satu Secretariat, the indigenous corporation that uh, manages the land claims for the Satu region. And through, I think, really a lot of vision from Charles McNeely and development of the remediation center that they have there, we've been involved in developing a training program for within the SATU related to climate change and remediation of contaminated sites. And so this has been work that we did this past year. And then this, this fall, that evolved into some of the community concerns from the Kosha Gotane Fort Good Hope about their new indigenous and territorial protected area, Tuyata. And so we spent a week with them this year on a training program because they want to essentially lead the research and develop the research for their protected area. And that was a really fun experience. We spent a week, there was 14 of us out there for a week. We installed four ground temperature stations. We did electrical resistivity. We did active layer surveys, did a whole bunch of things. But now they will have a poster on that work at the ICOP this coming year in June in Whitehorse. And then we just submitted a grant that, well, we supported them in a grant that they just submitted this week for an indigenous lead climate solutions. And I think that's where we see things evolving too, is that some support at the beginning and then later really indigenous led activities that we provide support to. And I think that's probably the way that um, it'd be nice to see more things evolving kind of that way. Uh, your question about the borehole data. So the borehole data was initially compiled by the Geological Survey of Canada from essentially the Mackenzie Valley gas pipeline, the Mackenzie, the, all of those historic projects. And it was up to date up to about 2020. And um, the Northwest Territories Geological Survey has been kind of taking over the maintenance of that database. And that's the database that we've been using. And then we've been supplementing it with every other kind of data that we can get our hands on. And so um, we've got good relationships with Tetra Tech, who are based in Edmonton, where we are. And so we've got access to some of their reports. Uh, uh, Vlad Ruzhanovsky, um has been really helpful that way. But there's always there's so much of that data that just exists in the gray literature for community reports and projects and engineering studies that um, we're always welcoming of additional data that can help to build that database because we want to cover as much of the landscape as we can to build these models as best we can to, to estimate ground ice. Yeah, hopefully that helps to answer the question. Wonderful. Um, it's lunchtime. Thank you for the wonderful discussion. Thank you to the theme leads uh, for the presentation and for the question we had. And um, enjoy your lunch. And see you back for the next session after lunch. <laughs>